Good morning uh, and good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are listening to us uh, from. Welcome to our latest European Structured Finance webinar. Uh, and in these webinars, we pick one topic related to a European securitization market and update our listeners on the DBRS Morningstar views and findings. This week, uh, we are discussing a topic that possibly impacts all those who were in offices but due to the pandemic adopted the new working home conditions. Um, and now the question arises if the office sector is is the new retail sector, whether there's enough uh, uh, impetus to bring the, the, the workers back into the offices. Um, my name is Vidasa Chaudhry and I head up the European Structured Finance Research Efforts at DBRS Morningstar here in London. And today I'm joined by our head of European CMBS, uh, Mirko Aikabuchi, and I'm also joined by uh, Dinesh Tapper, who is vice president in the European CMBS team at DBRS Morningstar. Uh, we will divide our time in a presentation, uh, which will be followed by a Q&A session. And the questions need to be asked in writing by typing into your computer or uh, um, or an app or which, whichever Bright Talk portal you're listening us from. Uh, we will answer these questions at the end of the presentation, but you can ask uh, questions at any time during uh, our presentation. So, without further ado, let's uh, let's move to the the main presentation. So as I mentioned, today we will walk the audience through what happened to to retail sector during uh, pandemic, um, uh, and this will be presented by Mirko. We will uh, present one of the the CMBS transactions as a case study, uh, and then Dinesh will uh, turn to the office sector and talk us through factors that are acting as tailwinds and headwinds for the sector. Um, and then we will conclude whether we think office sector may be moving into a phase of decline, um, as uh, we noticed with uh, CMBS retail side. Um, of course, we will also touch upon the issues in between like inflation, geopolitical concerns and ESG factors impacting the, the CMBS space. So with that, I hand over to Mirko to talk about European CMBS retail sector. Thanks, Modata, and thanks everyone for attending this uh, webinar. I will quickly give it, uh, a short um, introduction to what at, at the moment the ABS money stand rates in Europe in terms of transaction. So we at the moment have under surveillance uh, close to 11 billion of uh, European CMBS transaction. Uh, the large majority of these CMBS transaction are secured by logistic assets, almost 50%, which also explain why uh, CMBS uh, 2.0 has been performing quite well uh, even during the pandemic, as we have seen that uh, probably the logistic asset has been the one less negatively impacted by, by the pandemic crisis. If we move our attention instead, we focus our attention to the retail sector. We, uh, at the moment, have around 1 billion uh, of retail assets in our portfolio split among 10 loans in three uh, European jurisdictions. Uh, the UK, uh, Italy, and the Netherlands. And two of these 10 loans are at the moment in special servicing. Uh, this uh, webinar uh, in some way also represents a follow-up on the previous commentary that we did in December 2021, which, were, uh, which was focusing on the two asset classes that you know, we, we, we thought was largely impacted by the pandemic, which are you know, the, the retail and the hospitality sector. So today we basically keep focusing on the retail sector and, and we, we try to give a, an update on how we see in the market. Uh, and maybe just to give a, a positive note, we, we can uh, mention that uh, recently the latest investor report received by uh, TBRS Morningstar was starting to show uh, signs of, of a slowdown in the performance uh, downward trend of the retail properties, 
with the uh, occupancy figure and uh, rental income figures starting to finally show uh, a slightly uh, a slight improvement. So uh, I think we're probably most of, most of the people attending this webinar already know that uh, if we have to pick up uh, uh, an asset class in the retail, inside the retail sector that's been uh, particularly you know, uh, negatively impacted uh, by the pandemic, secondary shopping center are the most you know, likely candidate to be, <laughs> uh, to be nominated. And uh, however, inside this uh, asset type, we, we, need to see, we need to highlight that there's been differences among countries. So uh, provided that all this kind of asset have been negatively affected, uh, the UK, uh, unfortunately, the register, you know, the, the, the highest market value decline. And uh, in the transaction that we rate, we actually we register a, a market value decline for the asset in the range of 40%. Also in the Italy and the Netherlands, there's been market value decline, but the asset has been able to hold better with the loss of 20% for the Netherlands on average and 17% uh, for, for Italy. Once again, uh, the retail sector, which has been uh, initially impacted by the strong competition from e-commerce and uh, subsequently um, uh, the, the, the restriction uh, following the pandemic are now uh, feeling the pressure from uh, uh, another issue upcoming, which is uh, inflation. Uh, in particular, inflation, inflation pressure is likely to eat uh, income, you know, disposable income for uh, households and uh, increased cost. Uh, and as a result, uh, potentially uh, reduce sales uh, across, uh, across the world. We then focus on one uh, transaction, one loan, the Maroon loan, uh, which was uh, one of the two loans uh, originally securitized in Elizabeth Finance 2018 DAC which we think we give a good representation of, of what the retail sector had to go through in the last few years. So the loan uh, is, secured by, is secured by three uh, secondary shopping centers in, in the UK. And uh, uh, already at origination, the loan and the asset were feeling the pressure of you know, competition from e-commerce, uh, which was basically forcing many retail to reconsider the space in, the, in, in this asset. And actually, in some cases, even forcing some of retail, the retailers outside of business, uh, with some cases uh, of administration, or uh, some other CBA uh, situations. And uh, some, some of the pressure uh, can be seen even recently when Debenhams, uh, the main tenant of one of the assets, the Kingsgate uh, Center in Dublin, has finally decided to vacate the property in 2022, pushing the vacancy rate for, this up, for that asset up to 40%. So from this uh, first uh, pressure, um, the, you know, the, 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 the asset in this, uh, in this transaction have to then face the restriction of movement and you know the shop foreclosure coming from uh, the pandemic stress and finally uh, unfortunately for this loan uh, there was an upcoming maturity for the loan in january 21 20, 2021 which put further pressure on on, on the loan and uh, as a result uh, pushed the loan into special servicing as the original uh, sponsor was unable to, to refinance the deal. We also have to note that uh, here, uh, the, the, you know, along the life of this loan, there have been already some uh, some breach of covenants, which actually push uh, the major lender to um, exercise its rights and actually taking control of the asset. Um, subsequently, uh, following the, uh, the loan falling to default, uh, clearly, a special service was appointed, and uh, uh, quite recently, uh, the controlling Class D uh, decided to exercise the right to replace the initial special service CDRE with Mount Street, 
which uh, decided to temporarily suspend the sale of the asset initiated by the, by the previous special statute in order to stabilize the portfolio NOI and trying to wait for a, market, uh, a, a recovery of the retail investment market following the easing of, of, the, of the lockdown restriction. However, all the stresses that we mentioned before uh, caused to the uh, portfolio uh, to basically suffer from a significant market value decline. And from the initial valuation of uh, uh, close to 105 million, the latest revaluation re of the portfolio in March 2020 uh, actually saw the value decline to uh, just below 70 million. Uh, DBRS adjusted as well uh, the, our initial underwriting assumptions. Um, in particular, we increased our assumptions for vacancy from 20% uh, to 28%. Uh, as a result, our net cash flow decreased from 5.6 5 million to 4.8. And on top of that, we decided as well to uh, increase our cap rate from 7.7 .7 to 9.5. Uh, this resulted uh, in a new market value, uh, the direct stress market value of 50.4 million, which is uh, almost 27% uh, 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 cut to the latest valuation, and uh, which is um, also an art cut uh, to our 73.6 million initial uh, valuation. Uh, based on this number, the transaction has an underwriter LTV of 93 uh, versus a DBRS LTV of almost 20, 127. Um, I already mentioned the loan uh, has been now in special services since 2020. And uh, we, we think that uh, unless there is a considerable performance uh, improvement, uh, this will result uh, in the first European CMBS 2.0 to likely suffer a principal loss on a rated supporting tranche. And this is reflected in our latest rate action on this transaction, where we, uh, in particular, we downgraded class D to triple C level and class E to C level. So it's all negative for the retail sector. Well, we, I want to close you know, this uh, section with uh, some hopes uh, of a potential recovery. As I said uh, before, uh, the number uh, are starting to improve. We're seeing, you know, occupancy and uh, uh, NOI uh, growing again. Uh, and also, for for example, one asset, one fashion retail in uh, in Italy, we have, we also see we also have seen a, a really moderate uh, rebound in value. Also, I would like to mention that inside the the, the retail sector, uh, as there's been some you know asset that suffer more from the pandemic, there's also in some assets that have been uh, less impacted. In particular, the retail warehouse outside main city center uh, has been holding quite well during the pandemic and uh, the, 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 the value decline in, in, in that uh, sector has been uh, limited. As well as, for example, the, the fashion retail outlets uh, sector, which was already a, a bright spot uh, for the retail sector before, before the pandemic. Um, also, uh, in the asset that we we monitor, we could uh, register a limited uh, loss of value in the range of five percent. So, it's not all negative out there. Uh, however, I would like to make a, a last consideration. Clearly, uh, the retail sector is changing, uh, and the underwriting of the retail thing, uh, sector has to change as well. Oh, we are now seeing a uh, much shorter lease, which makes you know uh, clearly the cash flow much less predictable. As well as we, we are seeing a more uh, to know the component of, of the rent becoming uh, more relevant, uh, which in, in some way will force us to start to consider to underwrite this asset, almost some uh, like some operational asset and basically rely on some historical number which could uh, support uh, assumptions, for example, on, uh, on turnover sales. And with this, I conclude my section and I hand over to my colleague, Dinesh. Thank you, Mirko, and uh, good afternoon to everyone. As mentioned, I'm 
going to cover our views on the office sector as we emerge from the worst of the pandemic. And we'll uh, look at the impact of a more flexible or hybrid working model. So firstly, if we were to look at the office sector over time, we can see that it has generally performed quite well. And the demand for office space has always been quite strong. However, the disruption caused by the pandemic has been quite different in that it has forced businesses to change in the way in which they work. Um, we saw that businesses had to invest more in IT infrastructure to enable business continuity. Employees were forced to work from home and that being for the best part of two years. Now, in most cases, this has largely been productive. However, firms are now faced with the challenge of getting their staff back into the office. And I think it's fair to say that employees have become used to working from home and now place a much bigger focus on their well-being and on having a better work-life balance. Which means companies are having to rethink of ways to help employees balance productivity um, without losing a connection to the firm. Um, so from looking at the office take-up and vacancy rates, um, it gives us a good indication on how the office sector has performed over time. And here I've taken figures from CBRE for London, Paris, Amsterdam, and the three major office markets in Germany of Berlin, Munich, and Frankfurt. And if we look at the take-up chart, we see that post-GFC, so in 2008, um, these office markets largely returned back to pre-crisis levels within two years. Um, and London actually outperformed its European counterparts with take-up surpassing that of pre-crisis levels. If we, look at, um, if we look at Brexit in 2016, we saw that take-up in London fell. But conversely, during the same period, Paris and Germany saw take-up figures increase as some, some of the London-based firms moved their European businesses to the EU. From, so from 2015 to 2017, uh, the take-up levels in France increased by 17%, while in Germany it increased by 29%. Um, if we fast forward to the pandemic, um, we can see that the impact on take-up numbers was uh, was quite severe and um, uh, across all all European markets, um, but once again recovered well in 2021. Um, vacant, if we look at vacancies, um, now they have been showing an upward trend since 2019, and as one could expect, there have been some delays to take up and occupy movements over the lockdown period. Um, as well as there being slightly more supply coming onto the market. But here, London really does stand out negatively as it has reached its highest level since 2017. Uh, just moving forward, if we look at the quarter, figures on a quarterly basis, um, and with the exception of Amsterdam, the take-up levels have improved since Q2 2020. Um, and, and that said, the take-up levels for Amsterdam has only really fallen in the last quarter after following an upward trend in the previous three quarters. Uh, looking at the, the net absorption charts, um, this shows us that demand still remains positive for London, Paris and the German markets, um, although it did fall in the last quarter, whilst for Amsterdam, the demand still remains negative, although it did actually improve in the last quarter. Now, um, I wanted to touch, touch on the flexible office space as its very nature is based around the hybrid and flexible working models. Um, and also because we've seen a massive growth in this product type since 2014, which was largely driven by the rollout of WeWork. Largely, the 
co-working culture has been attracted to many startups and freelancers. However, as we would have expected, the demand for desk, desk space over the pandemic fell quite sharply across the whole of Europe. Um, typically, co-working flexible offices have had short leases which were easily broken um, during the pandemic, meaning that the transition for people to work from home was probably not too difficult. And we can see here that the, the take-up numbers fell in 2020 to less than half of that in 2019. Um, by looking at the, the numbers of 2021, the uh, utilization did improve. And although there may be some changes required to reduce office density, we think that the take-up figures will improve going forward, as it could be an efficient way for companies to manage additional space requirements without having to spend further capex. And going forward, those larger property owner, owners could see flexible space as an integral part of their portfolios. Um, we work after taking a big hit on their occupancy, have reported that their levels are running at 67% at the end of Q1 2022. So um, moving on to CMBS transactions backed by offices, uh, DBRS Morningstar rates nine European CMBS transactions, totaling 1.9 billion euros across seven transactions and 560 million sterling over two UK transactions. And with the exception of frozen 2018, all the transactions have continued to perform well since issuance and even during the pandemic. The, was no significant impact in respect of the underlying asset metrics or loan covenant. Um, I'll, do a, I'll do a quick run through of some of the transactions. Um, I think River Green Finance is worth mentioning as it was the first green bonds European CMBS issuance. The loan is backed by a campus style office in the western suburbs of Paris. And the property was awarded the Briam Very Good Certificate in 2017. And I'll touch on ESG considerations a bit later on. Um, but the transaction is performing well and wasn't really impacted by the pandemic. Uh, I mentioned Frozen 2018 earlier. Um, the transaction is backed by 45 largely secondary office assets in Finland. And um, the portfolio's performance has been deteriorating. And this is largely due to lease renewals being agreed at lower rents. There has also been a slight increase in vacancy as occupier demand has shifted towards more modern assets. Um, the portfolio vacancy rate is currently at 44%. Um, and our trend on these uh, notes remain negative. Um, just moving on to Salus, ELOC number 33. The loan is secured by a 35-storey office, office in London known as City Point. And this tr transaction is quite interesting in that there was uh, an ongoing refurbishment project. And now that the works are complete, there is still a marketing effort to lease up space. Over occupancy has reached 80%, with that being said, there have been significant improvements in the passing rent and the weighted average lease term has increased from 6.5 years at closing to 7.5 years. Um, and this shows us that the long lease lengths are still being achieved for newer modern assets. Um, lastly, if we look at Veridus, ELOC number 38. Uh, this load is secured by Oldgate Tower, uh, which again is a modern office building in the city of London. The property was fully occupied at closing, but WeWork actually surrendered their lease at the end of March 2021, albeit on favourable terms to the landlord. Um, that said, the, the space has now been relet and the occupancy is back up at 90% again showing us that there is still demand for new modern offices. Um, 
across the transactions rated by us, um, we can see here that the NOI was largely resilient to any negative impact on the pan of the pandemic and has not really deviated from issuance. Um, the DSCR remains quite high around four times, um, and this largely reflects the low interest rates that we're, we're experiencing. Um, the occupancy has remained relatively stable across all transactions and largely remains above 70%. Uh, once again, the outlier is uh, frozen 2018. And as previously mentioned, it's largely due to the shift in occupied demand for better quality assets. Uh, across the transactions, if we look at the weighted average lease term, um, it has remained fairly consistent at around five years. Um, however, it's worth mentioning that the two UK CMBS deals have a higher WALT of longer than seven, seven years. So looking forward and at the office environment and taking all these assets into consideration. Um, we believe that the office sector is in a period of transition. And when we look at the market data, it demonstrates that the offices are holding up fairly well. However, um, we feel as a hangover from the pandemic, there is a change in the way in which people now think about the workplace. And there is there is more emphasis on a work-life balance um, and social and well-being. Um, and that said, firms are now challenged to accommodate staff preferences in order to keep talent and to also attract new hires. And we feel the trend will move towards uh, lower office densities with uh, smarter technology and better amenities. We also believe there will be a much bigger movement towards ESG credentials in order to attract tenants and to help them reach their sustainability goals. And this in turn will lead to a wider gap between grade A greener assets with long lease terms and secondary older stock with shorter leases. And recently, and just to echo this transitional period that we've, we're seeing, uh, it's reported that M&G have recently spent 19 million on a post-COVID refurbishment on, of their offices to adapt to uh, more flexible working. However, uh, Deloitte, on, on the other hand, have uh, you know, it's been reported that Deloitte have uh, reduced their London office footprint, or are looking to reduce their London office footprint by a third um, over the last year or so. So, on that note, so I'll uh, I'll hand back over to uh, Madassa. Thank you very much, Dinesh, for the presentation. And this would be a good opportunity for audience to ask us any questions while I make the concluding remarks. So, uh, in summary, retail sector has suffered in the past couple of years, but we are seeing signs of recovery. Uh, some consumer behaviors that started as trends are now entrenched in everyday life, like um, shopping online, which uh, is resulting in better, bigger, greener warehouse spaces and storage spaces, and having a negative impact on the usage of traditional brick and mortar retail spaces. On the office side, we do not see the office sector to go into a structural decline, um, but want to be in a tr transition. And the transition in use of space from uh, dedicated desk spaces to more floating uh, desk policies, flexible or hybrid working models, uh, more communal and recreational areas within the office buildings and better equipped offices to increase the inclusivity of team members taking part from uh, remote locations. Therefore, we see demand of offices uh, to continue and as Dinesh mentioned, to grow. 
mainly the grade A smart sustainable office spaces with uh, potentially longer leases. And these factors will also act as a catalyst to um, refurbish uh, the aging stock of secondhand spaces. So with this, um, we conclude uh, our uh, webinar. And we have also uh, published a commentary this morning titled um, European Office Sector and the Impact of Flexible Working. Um, along, along with all the latest research, uh, this can be found uh, on dbrsmorningstar.com. Uh, there you will also find uh, our contact details should you uh, wish to ask us any questions uh, at a later date. Um, and replay of this webinar will also be available along with the presentation slides on our website. And I take the opportunity then to thank our audience for listening and thank you Mirko and Dinesh for giving us your valuable time.